Uh, I'm not going to show any slides because um, the paintings are over in the museum. So, uh, and otherwise, I stand here and say, and I painted that one. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to talk that much about art either. Um, if I had to put a title on this, I'd call it "So You Want to Be an Artist." So it's a little, a little bit addressed to the students uh, more than more than other people. So I'm really lucky to be here. Um, being a freelance artist in the New York area is hard. Uh, when I came here, I couldn't believe that they actually sent me a check every month. I didn't have to yell at somebody over the telephone saying, send me my check. It, 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 was, it was a nice job and it was thrilling to work with um, serious uh, young artists. These, these kids I, I teach. Of course, at my age, retired people are starting to look like kids. So. Um, even though I fe always feel a little guilty after 50 years in this business <coughs> trying to teach kids how to make art because I feel sometimes like telling them it's a very hard job, a very hard thing to do. I mean, there are problems with this business. Um, being an artist is fun, it can be fun, but it's not easy. Uh, our conventions have melted away in the last 20 years or so. Uh, it used to be painting and sculpture, and now art can be anything. And when anything can be art, art sometimes isn't much of anything. Uh, Oscar Wilde said it. He said, art is useless. He said, you can't eat it, you can't drive it, you can't live in it. But people, uh, so we're, we're teaching kids to make something that's useless that nobody has to buy. Uh, but people still spend millions of dollars for a little thing with ten dollars worth of materials in it, but that's a mystery, so I won't try to solve that. And making abstract art is particularly hard. I mean, people think it's easy to make an abstract painting because it's just a bunch of paint, just a mess, but of course you have to make something out of that mess. I remember once years ago my father uh, came back from a reunion party at his college and he looked, and he, he was always giving me a hard time about my paintings. And he said, <clears throat> you know, I can do that. <laughs> and I said, okay, here's a canvas and some paint, Dad, and some brushes, so why don't you do it? So he stood there, went down to his boxer shorts, and he stood there, and he <laughs> took a brush and went like this, and went like this, and a half hour went by, an hour went by. And finally he said, okay, I did it. And I looked at it, it was a horrible green smudge. And I said, Dad, that sucks. He said, just as good as anything over there that you know. <laughs> and, okay, so we left it at that. <laughs> but he never criticized my painting. <laughs> it's hard for artists now, for a lot of reasons, young artists starting out. For one thing, there are too many artists. Too much art. If there are 100,000 artists in New York City, and I think that's conservative, and each one makes one work of art every month, every 10 works a year, that's a million works of art. Like Carl Sagan used to say about the stars, that means when you add it all up, everywhere in the whole world, there's billions and billions and billions of works of art. That's not an art problem, that's a disposal problem. <laughs> <coughs> if plumbing was as popular as art, we'd have thousands of people in stained clothing and wrenches and plungers climbing in and out of sewers, writing about pipe systems, and none of our toilets would work. <laughs> but if you really feel it and you want to do it, you would anyway. I wanted to be an artist from the time I was seven because I was fairly good at it as a kid. I could draw realistic birds. I was passionate about birds and obsessed with flying. And <clears throat> they weren't great pictures, but you could tell the difference between a mallard and a Canadian goose in one of my pictures. 
uh, I didn't get much encouragement from my family, but I didn't get much discouragement either. Uh, my father, who was a businessman and really wanted to be a farmer, naturally wanted his children to be solid, successful citizens. And what did he get? He got me, an artist. He got my brother, an actor. And he got my sister, who married a folk singer. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> the folk singer did really well, anyway. Um, if we moved from the country when I was about 12. And I had to get involved in something else. So I got interested in photography. I had a little camera called a Fed Flash. And this was a long time ago, you know, way before digital anything. And I went around taking photographs of the town we had moved to as a kind of documentary thing. And the chemistry, and of course that's all we had back then was chemistry. I mean, nobody had even thought of digital yet. The chemistry involved in developing the pictures, because back then when you had pictures to have developed, you took them to the drugstore and they did a terrible job. So I developed my own and I got much more interested in chemistry. And I was still a teenager, I was about 14 years old. And, when you, and I, I got interested in chemistry and got my own little lab together. And when you were 14 back then and you had a little lab, chemistry, there's one thing you did. You made bombs. <laughs> so I was a big hit at school because I could bring a bottle and I could throw it and it would explode like a grenade. And this was something that made me kind of popular because I was smart bombs. I think I almost took the leg off the good humor man once when I was and all my friends asked me, what do you use in this bomb? And I didn't want to tell them because it was my trade secret. And, um, but one kid, I, you know, begged me and begged me. And so finally I told him, you take this chemical and you take that chemical and you very, very carefully put them together. So he took this chemical and that chemical and put them together and started grinding them. <laughs> and the thing went off right in his face. And he wasn't seriously injured, but it took off all of his hair and all of his eyebrows. It just completely singed them right off. And from that time on, he was known, his nickname was Baldy, of course. Now, uh, that incident pretty much ended my little personal lab. Um, but I was still a great favorite of my science teacher, Mr. Denny, who let me. Um, experiment on my own in the school lab, as long as I wasn't making bombs. And I took on, I won't get into the details of it, but I took on a chemical experiment that all the scientists said could not be done. And Mr. Denny said that could be done. Now I built my structures and everything just like you see in a science fiction movie. And one day I got a couple of white crystals and I said, Mr. Denny, Mr. Denny, look, I have accomplished the thing that all the scientists said could not be done. And he said, <clears throat> Bannon, you're a smart kid, but you're no Einstein. So uh, that was discouraging. But then I got in trouble a lot, so they sent me away to boarding school and I said, okay, now I can learn some real science from some real professionals. And um, I took chemistry, I got an A in it, I memorized the periodic table, I learned all this stuff, I was really flying high. And then I took physics and I ran across a thing called Boyle's and Charles inverse gas ratios. I failed the test. And I went to my instructor and said, this really puts a crimp on my science career, I think. And he said, you know, Banner, you're a smart kid, but you're no Einstein. <laughs> All right, so I was no Einstein. <clears throat> About a year after that, I was fortunate enough to be nominated. I was very interested in black music. Of course, back then you didn't call it black music. It was called Negro music. This was way before civil rights. And um, I uh, wrote my thesis on Negro blues. 
And my instructor was so thrilled with this that he put me up, nominated me for the for the prize for the best essay, uh, senior essay in this boarding school I was going to. So I said, okay, this is good. Maybe I can be um, maybe I can be a uh, a writer. I'll become a writer. This was my new course of success. And then I went away to college. I went to Princeton. They had a very good creative writing program with a famous critic named R.P. Blackmore. And <clears throat> I worked very hard on my writing. I stayed up all night writing. And uh, I, I, I noticed that Mr. Blackmore seemed to favor the other students' writing more than my writing. And I was disturbed by this. So I went to Mr. Blackmer and I said, I, I said, you know, I think you like other students' writing more than my writing. I want you to explain why. And he said, well, Banner, he said, you're not a bad writer, especially with nonfiction, but you're no Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that took care of writing. 